Taking Aim with Ralph Schoenman and Maya Schoen coming to you Tuesday, October 7th, 2003. In the old days, when I was invited to drop in for a chat with Alan Dulles, the CIA was housed in a rambling group of brick Victorian buildings on a small hill overlooking Foggy Bottom. Those visits were like a page out of Agatha Christie. There were always tweedy men like Dulles with him, and the men's faces were lean and handsome, the kind you saw in whiskey ads, leaning indolently beside tall fireplaces in English country houses, or perhaps their Long Island equivalents. Times have changed at the CIA. Headquarters has moved across the river to the enormous complex at Langley, and there is nothing Victorian about the director's office these days. But the fundamental question remains what it has been all along. The tweeds, the pipe, the aromatic tobacco, the fine accents of Boston and Philadelphia were never more than a con. The real face of the CIA is the man with the angle iron, the enforcer. The bottom line at the CIA is blackmail, the squeeze, and killing. Like the mafia, it is a brotherhood where the case officers, those slated to be covert agents, make their careers running paid agents, subverting governments, carrying out assassinations, instigating coup d'etat, corrupting political parties and newspapers, and if they climb high enough up the ladder, running major operations such as the infamous Phoenix program of political murder and execution in South Vietnam that was directed by William Colby and took 60,000 lives. These are the gentlemen killers of the CIA, wrote Harrison Salisbury, the Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times journalist and author in the May 1975 issue of Penthouse magazine. Our Taking Aim program today is dedicated to Lou Wolf, whose courage and dedication with the publication of Covert Action Bulletin and then Covert Action Information Quarterly made so many aware of the importance of outing the gentlemen killers of the CIA. Ralph? Harrison Salisbury was the leading foreign correspondent for the New York Times, chief correspondent in Moscow, and furthermore, a major spokesperson for official policy all through his long and uh, well-honored career, <clears throat> Pulitzer Prize included, at the New York Times. Indeed, I recall vividly Harrison Salisbury because at the time that we were uh, involved in the International Tribunal on War Crimes in Indochina, Ho Chi Minh and Pham Van Dong asked us to recommend and to arrange a, an American correspondent to come to Hanoi, one of the first, in fact, the first official uh, correspondents that the Vietnamese were prepared to allow access to areas that were always targeted for bombardment. And after much discussion with Harrison Salisbury, we came to the conclusion that he represented a sector of the class that had, that had come to the view that this war was not advantageous any further to American imperialism. I mention this because Harrison Salisbury, not so long after that, was uh, in the forefront of opposing the nature and character of the specific policy that, of which Vietnam was an expression and a paradigm. In his uh, extraordinary article in Penthouse in May 1975, as Maya indicated, entitled The Gentlemen Killers of the CIA, the subheading was The Agency Has Always Employed Murder and subversion. Salisbury writes that CIA intervention in Chile against the government of the late Salvador Allende was any kind of a freak. The, quote, destabilization of Allende was CIA business as usual. The CIA attempted to destabilize many governments. CIA efforts to topple existing regimes are accurate. Some are public and some are not. Two of the most notorious notes, Salisbury, were the CIA effort in Iran against Mossadegh and then its effort in Shikar against Sukarno in Indonesia. 
He notes that the CIA has links to the police departments and especially to the security police of countless countries and to those of every Latin American government. If the chance is to be broken because of a coup d'etat, um, it is immediately reforged with the new administration. The same is true of all uh, generals and armed forces of all Latin American countries. The bottom line of the CIA, writes Harrison Salisbury, is blackmail, the squeeze, and killing. Some people have known this simple truth from the beginning. But the CIA has a con, and that con had a lot going for it and was bought by many. He, he continues, how did the con work? The most comprehensive picture of the hidden mechanisms and in inner psychology of the CIA was given by Philip A. G., he writes, who was recruited into the company upon graduating from Notre Dame in 1956 and who resigned in 1969, thoroughly disillusioned after 13 years of service in Latin America. Indeed, he cites how a. G., uh, Philip A. G. Was, was brought to the realization of what it was he was, uh, he was conducting for the Central Intelligence Agency because he describes how uh, the many, many people that he uh, was fingering for the CIA across Latin America were somehow removed from his understanding as to the consequences of their, det of their uh, detention until he was present when he heard the actual uh, sounds of torment as genitalia were being uh, attached to, uh, uh, to electrodes and the uh, victim going into spasms of agony. It was this confrontation with the concrete meaning of his daily work for 13 years that traumatized Philip Agee and resolved him to break with the crimes of which he had been, uh, to which he had been party uh, for so many years. As, and Harrison Salisbury writes, the CIA men feel no remorse over the killings, the killing of Premier Mossadegh of Iran, the killing of Che Guevara. These are called targets, and the killing is always carried out uh, with impunity. The, the fact that the security police of Ecuador, of Uruguay, a kill and torture men on the CAA target list had hardly bothered Philip A.G. until that chance occurrence in the Montevideo Peace Headquarters, Police Headquarters when he confronted the loud moans coming from the room from the target he had named to the police as a picana, a hand-operated generator applied to the man's genitals this, uh, as, the, uh, as uh, Harrison Salisbury uh, describes. Let's look at these police chiefs and their assistants. According to Salisbury and documented by many others, they are brought to Washington to attend the International Police Institute courses and are routinely put on CIA payrolls. The co-option of Latin American armed forces occurs through, quote, training programs which bring candidate officers to the United States. The ties are kept operative by the CIA and its golden stream of funds when the men go back to their countries. Now, let's look at some of the other methods which we are going to discuss in further detail throughout the show. Ordinarily, it says, the CIA has its creative talent section one devoted to concocting forged documents, falsified speech, speeches, and other materials for circulation in the local press. The CIA buys editors and provides them with the necessary copy. Forged documents, for instance, quotes uh, Salisbury, were an important element in the CIA-sponsored overthrow of President Arosemena in Ecuador in 1963. The same technique was used to provoke a diplomatic break between Peru and Cuba. The CIA take genuine materials and insert a few false phrases. Or they take two or three documents, run them together, include a favorable reference to some local official whose reputation they wish to taint. And then the materials surface, possibly in an airport customs examination or the CIA plants them with the police to be, quote, found on an in innocent victim. 
The most famous of such concoctions were the Penkovsky Papers, which were a compilation of partly true, partly invented materials, supposedly written as a memoir by a famous Soviet double agent. Ralph? In real life, Harrison Solberg describes... The CIA resembles nothing so much as a great and closed fraternity. Indeed, it is a, an arena in which everything is kept secret and kept to itself. All activities are classified as top secret, and people are not allowed to refer to, uh, to themselves in other terms. They are what are called non-witting individuals, and non-witting is, as Salisbury describes it, the CIA's secret lingo. A witting person in CIA speak means a person in the know, an agency man. No witting man ever talks about technique. He speaks about tradecraft. The lingo is familiar. Safe houses, dead drops, cutouts, flutter, walk-ins, recruits. Cold picks, attempts to recruiting agents cold by walking up to them. Infill, exfill, burn and blow, sabotage. The false flag operations, whereby operations are carried out in the name of those you want to uh, uh, demonize. The standard procedure for all major imperial operations, as, 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 as acknowledged by Salisbury. The men know each other by cryptonyms, code names. So CIA men in clandestine service bear these. A company man, a man's cryptonym and the nickname stems from this and this all in the service of murder of sabotage of betrayal of destruction destruction of the uh, targets of American rulers and these are invariably the people who are engaged in movements of social reform movements for national independence movements for reclaiming of natural resources movements for mobilizing the colonially oppressed movements in opposition to imperial reach it is that that the gentlemen killers of the CIA are mandated to destroy and like the mafia he writes the agency is a true brotherhood. The company will do anything, lie, cheat, and I quote, steal, kidnap, suborn perjury, bribe, corrupt, subvert, kill, and kill again. If you are of the blood, the company cares for you. If you are not, you are disposable, you are dispendable, expendable. And it's Harrison Salisbury, from the inside, writes in Penthouse in May 1965. Seventy-five. Seventy-five, sorry. The company placement agency finds places suitable to the talents, temperament, and training in their big active department. Of course, there are certain individuals, agents, operatives, hired hands, who are scheduled for termination with extreme prejudice. No employment, no financial benefits are, allowed, are involved here. It's a job for the coroner if the body ever turns up. This similarity to the Mafia is noticeable, but the agency terminates its own career employees in the Mafia manner whenever they know too much or are, possible, uh, are, are, are possibly about to disclose the right names, the right places, the right accents, the company determines. Having been chosen, you are tested. The company's sister service in England, MI6, for so many years clubbable and cozy that it, it tested candidates by inv inviting them uh, to uh, country houses is no longer the method. These men make their careers running agents, subverting governments, carrying out assassination, instigating coup d'etat, corrupting political leaders, infiltrating and growing newspapers, and if they are able and shrewd enough, they climb up high enough on the ladder to run major operations such as the Phoenix program of political murder in South Vietnam. It involves political murder. It involves execution on a large scale. It involves rounding up the members of target organizations, of target popular movements, of target students, of target trade unionists of target cheaters to teachers authenticated instances of victims being interrogated in hel helicopters hurled overboard a program of political murder that is sustained let's look at some examples the government of the Shah of Iran was a virtual creation of the CIA confirmed by Harrison Salisbury the agency engineered the overthrow of Mossadegh in a coup planned by one of the CIA's most skillful black operators, 
Kermit Roosevelt. The Shah's security forces were trained and equipped by a succession of American and CIA specialists. For many years, the CIA station chief in Tehran was understood by foreigner and Persian alike to be the second most important man in the country, and many felt he was the most important. He lived in grandiose style, writes Salisbury, in an exquisite suburban villa, and his dinners were a gourmet's delight. The Shah hardly made a move without consulting his CIA advisor. Philip Agee estimated that in a single year, the CIA poured at least $300,000 into the Uruguayan police apparatus in bribes, equipment, and so-called training trips to Washington. Another example cited by Agee was Brazil where he noted that in a fairly typical election campaign, the CIA had funded 8 of 11 state governorship races, 15 candidates for the Senate, 250 candidates for the Chamber of Deputies, and about 600 candidates for the state legislature. There was hardly a political leader, newspaper editor, student leader, or labor chief in Latin America at the time when A.G. was writing who was not approached by the CIA at one time or another. And uh, the CIA attempted to put that person on the payroll. In Ecuador, the legislator who became vice president had his monthly CIA stipend. And the CIA's effort against Allende in Chile did not begin the year or so before his downfall in 1973. It began as early as the early 1960s. The CIA was so heavily involved in fighting Allende in the 1964 Chilean election that the company could not obtain enough Chilean escadudos on the open market to finance its operations. It had to send out an emergency call to stations in Lima, Rio, Montevideo, and other places to buy all the foreign exchange that it could lay hands on. The CIA won in 1964, but in 1970, even more frantic efforts failed to keep Allende from power. His ouster and murder merely culminated a policy that had been applied continuously for a decade. Maya, the company man, as Harrison Salisbury reveals, enters, quote, an unreal world. He lives his cover. He exists 24 hours a day, 365 days a year as someone else. He is living his lie. His superficial identity may be that of a quiet young U.S. embassy clerk in Ecuador. In fact, he is the tiger who runs street mobs, mobs assembled by local agent for convenient sums paid in gold and deposited in Swiss bank accounts to, de- to, to, to destabilize a shaky reform government, to enable a bunch of fascist officers to take over, to stabilize the situation through roundups and detentions and systematic torture and killing and disappearances. The standard CIA procedure, increasing the security of their masters and holding back the tidal wave of popular demand for change. A mass of material about the CIA is now available. There's no longer any pretense. There's no longer any grounds for pretended ignorance. The CIA destabilized governments ad seriatim. The CIA efforts have been made to topple existing regimes in all parts of the world. Some attempts are most public, others are not. And he continues, The CIA has links to the police departments and to the security police of countless countries, of every American, Latin American government. The same is true of general staffs, of armed forces, and all those governments that are targeted. Yes, but the CIA also has close ties to the larger U.S. multinational corporations who collaborate with the CIA in what is a much little investigated area at the time Salisbury was writing in 1975, but has been further investigated since then. Most notably was the relationship of ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph, in Chile. But... uh, We have spoken over the past weeks of the relationship of Vanell 
the Nell, so active now in Iraq and Saudi Arabia. The Nell, as revealed by Wil- Wilbur Crane Everland, provided him for cover when he was a CIA operative. As Harrison Salisbury writes, Many of these relationships are very long-standing and have been institutionalized over the years. Cover is provided for CIA operations and intelligence is traded. Colby, that's William Colby, often expresses his gratitude for corporate collaboration in his speeches to business groups. The community of interest between the U.S. and multinational corporations was, of course, classically demonstrated by ITT in Chile. Let's look at a specific example of CIA collaboration with corporations. An important article appeared in the International Herald Tribune, January 3, 1978, about the CIA manipulation of the media, entitled CIA Secretly Built Manipulated a Global Propaganda Network. And it discusses the unremitting, though largely unrecognized, effort to shape foreign opinion in support of U.S. policy abroad and, I'll go on to say, to shape the opinion here in the United States. The agency, according to the International Herald Tribune article by John Crutzen, has channeled information and misinformation through a substantial network of newspapers, news agencies, and other communication entities that are owned, subsidized, or otherwise influenced by the CIA over the years. The CIA employed American reporters as agents, numbered others as sources of information or, quote, assets useful to its operations. And the New York Times did a survey at the time of the CIA's relationships with the U.S. news organizations. Ralph? As a matter of fact, Maya, the article by John Crudson, an extremely detailed article, January 3rd, 1978, in the International Herald Tribune, the CIA has refused every demand for detail on its secret relationship with American journalists and foreign journalists and news gathering organizations across the United States. The CIA has owned and subsidized over 50 newspapers outright. In addition to news services, radio station chains, periodicals, and television stations and other communication entities in this country overseas use as vehicles for propaganda efforts for cover for their operations and both foreign uh, over one uh, over a dozen foreign based news organizations and agencies are financed financed by the central intelligence agency and fully infiltrated by paid central intelligence agents over a dozen us publishing houses including the most prominent names in the industry print at least 250 english language books financed or produced by the cia in a space of 5 years since the closing days of world war 2 over 100 us journalists employed by a score of U.S. news agencies work as salaried intelligence operatives while performing their nominal repertorial duties. Others are employed by the American military, and according to the intelligence revelations as documented here, they are permeating all means of communication throughout the United States, put out by the CIA over channels around the world, including the Italian news agency ANSA, including the news services of countless countries. Thirty-four paragraphs were cited of, uh, for officials written by counterintelligence experts at CIA headquarters, which were generalized as the news service releases in countries across the world. Ralph, when William Colby, the former CIA director, was asked if the CIA ever told such its agents what to write, Colby replied, quote, Oh, sure, all the time. In other words, the CIA is the author of official outright fabrications. Yes, Maya, as as, uh, Crudson writes, in the past 30 years, dozens of full-time CIA officers worked to control reporters, non-editorial employees, and all U.S.-owned news organizations. The the agency's broad campaign of propaganda is carried out with the awareness that the bogus news stories are treated as genuine with knowledge by the U.S. media. 
Lyman Kirkpatrick, the CIA's Inspector General, stated that this was standard procedure. Indeed, he, he, the CIA's efforts to mold opinion range from tampering with historic documents to fabricating information to specifying propaganda for furthering the policy aims of U.S. rulers. According to former CIA officials, the agency has long had an early warning network within the U.S. government that, that, that advises diplomats and key officials of key stories that have been planted by the agency. There is a mechanism for alerting newspapers papers and magazines and broadcasting stations as to what is expected of them on a given issue at a specific time, the International Herald Tribune continues. We tell UPI or AP headquarters in the United States when we are planting something. As CIA official says, the stories are transmitted over these agencies, domestic news wires, and they permeate and they continue. Nearly all the American journalists employed by the Central Intelligence Agencies have been used for the collection of intelligence, support for CIA operations, and indeed such agents become knowing channels of disinformation to the U.S. public the International Herald Tribune Ralph, continues. You, you refer to historical record, and a classic example described in this International Herald Tribune article is one that deals with the speech that Soviet Prime Minister Nikita Khrushchev delivered his secret five-hour speech to the closing session of the 20th Communist Party Congress in Moscow, from which all foreign delegates had been excluded. And it was in that speech that Khrushchev had attacked Stalin, his predecessor, and he had described him as a savage, half-mad despot. Now, the word went out to the CIA that they could get a copy, that they must get a copy of the text. And by late May, the agency's counterintelligence staff, writes the uh, Herald Tribune, had succeeded in obtaining a text in Poland. A few late days later, it was released to U.S. news agencies through the State Department. There was something interesting about that text. The text obtained was an expurgated version, and it was prepared for delivery for the nations of Eastern Europe. And 34 paragraphs of the material uh, had concerning the future Soviet foreign policy had been deleted. And what the CIA did, what it delivered to the U.S. newspapers, was another text containing precisely 34 paragraphs of material on future foreign policy that was written by the CIA counterintelligence experts. And the article in this regard specifies the following. The thousands of books published by the Central Intelligence Agency uh, in the United States contained propaganda ranging from fiction to outright deception. One such book, the Penkovsky Papers, was published for what the Senate Committee called operational reasons by the Central Intelligence Agency through Doubleday and Company. The book be purported to be the jur a journal kept by a Soviet agent, Colonel Oleg Penkovsky, but indeed the information in the book was contrived and compiled by Central Intelligence Agency operative Frank Gidney, an employee of the Chicago Daily News, quote, it was not a diary, it was a major deception. And indeed, Mr. Gibney conceded that the journal did not exist. This is but one concrete example of a continuing process. Thousands of CIA books, control of publishing houses, permeation of the mass media, the complete penetration of all the main means of communication by actual operatives, operational functioning, uh, subversive operatives who seek to destroy the actual function of a news service by converting it into the propaganda arm of an intelligence service. The current operations of the Shah, Harrison Salisbury continues, the virtual creation of the CIA are but the little continuation of what is done in almost every country. The Shah of Iran. The work in Laos, the ten year, for more than ten years, the CIA ran the secret war and trained the Mayo 15,000 to 20,000 Mayo tribesmen through a command force of 300 to 400 CIA personnel. For more than 10 years, they were running that operation. In, you name the country throughout the world, and you are going to find the operations of the CIA, whether it's Western Europe, 
whether it's Asia, whether it's Africa or Latin America, the CIA is at work. You are listening to Taking Aim with Fraction. and Maya Schoen on WBAI 99.5 FM in New York and on the Internet at on www.wbai.org. Our program today outing the gentlemen killers of the CIA. If you missed this program or would like to rehear it or hear any of our other shows, go to our website, www.takingaim.info, where we have a program archive. We dedicated this program to Lou Wolf, who began Covert Action Bulletin, which today is Covert Action Information Quarterly. And Lou Wolf, along with Phil Agee, published remarkable books called, in 1978, Dirty Work, the CIA in Western Europe, edited by Phil Agee and Lou Wolf, and then Dirty Work 2, the CIA in Africa, edited by Ellen Ray, William Schaap, Carl Van Meter, and Lewis Wolf. And these over 700-page books, voluminous books, describe in great detail the work of the CIA. But most importantly, they provide a who's who of the CIA operatives. As Phil Agee wrote in the introduction, since the late 1960s and the Vietnam War, The CIA, indeed the entire American government, has faced several of the most brilliant agents who have quit in disgust, and they have told their secrets to the world, especially to the American people. Daniel Ellsberg, a former U.S. Defense Department official, published openly the Pentagon Papers. Victor Marchetti, a top aide to the CIA's deputy director, joined with former State Department intelligence officer John Marks to write The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. Phil Agee himself wrote his Inside the Company, a CIA diary. And John Stockwell sent his open letter to Stansfield Turner and authored a book, In Search of Enemies. Frank Snepp exposed the last days of U.S. rule in Saigon. And importantly, there was an article that was published in 1974, November 1974, in the issue of Washington Monthly in Washington, D.C., entitled, How to Spot a Spook. And it was written by John Marks. And in it, John Marks describes how by using public documents, particularly diplomatic lists, Uh, in countries throughout the world, it is possible to locate who is who of the CIA agents because, for the most part, they operate under diplomatic cover of the State Department. As John Marks wrote, more than a quarter of the 5,435 employees at the time who purportedly work for the State Department of State overseas are actually with the CIA. In places such as Argentina, Bolivia, Burma, and Guyana, where the agency has special interests and projects, there are as many CIA operatives undercover of substantive embassy jobs as there are legitimate state employees. And then, in other places where the CIA has extensive military operations, such as in Japan and Germany, the CIA embeds its operatives under the the auspices of the Pentagon. Ralph? In How to Spot a Spook, and in the revelatory documents that were the uh, genesis of Covert Action Bulletin, and in Dirty Works, the two books that you cite, the task has been to expose, and Lou Wolf and Phil A. G. went through over 40,000 pages of documentation of State Department publications, U.S. Embassy personnel lists, diplomatic lists of foreign ministries aboard, and other perfectly overt sources, and assembled documents in a global index of CIA operations and personnel available for every interested scholar, historian, journalist, and political activist who seeks to oppose the secret interventions and killings of the Central Intelligence agencies. And indeed in their introduction, Phil, A.G. and Lou Wolf 
These researchers plan a continuing program to distribute rail regular bulletins worldwide, to report personnel transfers and new assignments. We will seek to expose the CIA attempts to carry out secret operations through its, co through its cooperating foreign intelligence services around the world, the operations on behalf of multinational corporations. They set themselves the task of exposing a program of organized murder, of s sabotage, of, dis of subversion of governments, of destruction of mass movements, of the targeting of leaders of, of, uh, stu of students and trade unionists and peasants for social change, for national independence, for sovereignty, for resistance to their conquest and exploitation by a rapacious imperial power. By the time uh, Lou Wolf uh, ended the naming names sections in, of Covert Action Bulletin in October of 1981, 1,000 CIA covert operatives had been exposed. As Phil Agee writes in his introduction to Dirty Work, the CIA in Western Europe, quote, many people still seem to believe the myths used to justify this secret political police force referring to the CIA. Some of the myths are, of course, actively spread by my former CIA colleagues. Others come from their liberal critics. But whatever the so source, until we lay the myths to rest, they will continue to confuse people and permit the CIA literally to get away with murder. As he writes, the covert operations the covert action operations abroad are not sui generis. They happen because they respond to internal U.S. requirements. We cannot wish them away through fantasies of some enlightened president or Congress who would end American subversion of foreign peoples and institutions by the wave of a wand. Only prior radical change within the United States change that will eliminate the process of accumulating the value of foreign labor and resources will finally allow an end to secret intervention abroad. Until then, we should expect more intervention by the CIA and multinational corporations, not less. Increasingly important will be the repressive capability of the your agency's sister services abroad. End quote. And as we have documented on many of our Taking Aim shows, foremost among those sister services is the Israeli Mossad. But as Phil A.G. and Lou Wolf uh, uh, describe it, the CIA is an action agency above all. Theirs is the area of interventionist action, invasion by Marines. They target the same everywhere. Governments they don't like political parties, the military, the police, the secret services, the trade unions, youth and student organizations, culture and professional societies, and public information media. The CIA props up its operatives and beats down its opponents. It furthers U.S. hegemony so that American multinational corporations and U.S. rulers can intensify their exploitation of the natural resources and labor of foreign lands. This is their mandate. This is their function. This is their permanent occupation. And he states, There is a myth that the major problem is lack of control, that the CIA is a rogue elephant. This myth comes not from the CIA, but from its liberal cr critics. Those liberal critics who accept the equation between patriotism and the Central Intelligence Agency's murderous operations who accept the national interest as that of the ruling class and accepts the we in the United States as embracing the state apparatus of exploitation and murder as opposed to the we of the many, the working people who are exploited, the working people who are subjugated no less in the United States than in every other part of the world. For the Central Intelligence Agency, its covert operations follow the orders as Phil A.G. and Lou Wills, the state of, su of successive presidents of each National Security Council of every administrative uh, regime that assumes power in the United States. It is their instrument. It is their 
operational, functioning murder apparatus. It is not ours. It is not that of the people who they target. It is theirs for the very purpose of carrying out these criminal operations on behalf of a gangster state. And that is the gravamen. That is the point of this mewling, whining, bleating, hands on heart, eyes rolled to heaven, bewailing of the disclosure of the role of Joseph Wilson IV and his operative wife, Victoria Plain. For Joseph Wilson IV was the deputy director of station at, uh, uh, in Baghdad at the time of the first Gulf War, the de facto ambassador to Iraq, who on behalf of Bush Sr. had been, been uh, directing Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran to amputate Khuzestan, a million lives cost in that bleeding war between Iraq and Iran, sp uh, in, uh, instigated by Zbigniew Brzezinski on behalf of Central Intelligence, on behalf of the National Security Agency, and continued up to the very moment when Saddam Hussein was ensnared in Kuwait as the pretext for launching the Gulf War long prepared. That is the function that has been continuous that is described so eloquently in the seminal work of Lou Wolf and Phil Agee. Ralph, let's look a bit at Valerie Plain, uh, Wilson's wife, who is a CIA operative. What has come out is that she was working under a corporate identity of Brewster Jennings and Associates. And this first appeared in the Federal Election Commission records, again, a public document, in a form that she filled out in 1999, where the case officer was at the, who was at the center of the controversy, because she contributed $1,000 to Al Gore's primary, uh, presidential primary campaign at the time, and so her name was revealed, and she had to give her company. But the company according to the Washington Post in an article October 4th by Walter Pincus and Mike Allen, was, as confirmed by the administration, a CIA front. And in fact, this obscure and possibly defunct, according to the um, Washington per Post firm, who was listed by Plain as her, on her W-2 tax form in 1999, while undercover for the CIA, it doesn't have a telephone. It is not listed. And the Brewster Jennings and Associates uh, doesn't have an address. The phone listing is not in service, and the property manager at the address li that she listed stated that there was no such company at the property. There is no such firm, I'm convinced, according to uh, a government official. CIA people are not supposed to list themselves with fictitious firms if they are under deep cover. They're supposed to be real firms. This sort of adds to the mystery. And that was stated by Robert Novak, who's the syndicated journalist who outed Valerie Plain. Ralph? The uh, CIA operative Ray McGovern on Pacifica Network disclosed that Wilson was the deputy chief of mission in Baghdad, particularly important to Bush Sr., and he revealed the operations as deputy chief of mission in Baghdad just prior to the 90, uh, 1991 Iraq War and his services to Bush Sr., that is why he was sent to Africa, to Niger, where indeed the former ambassador Joe Wilson, quote, knew Africa like the palm of his hand, having served in, in, in Niger as ambassador and to other countries in Africa. This functioning operative, deputy chief of mission in Baghdad, now in, uh, now in Africa, was sent to Niger to check out the reports about uranium for nuclear weapons coming from, uh, uh, from Niger to uh, supposedly to Iraq. And indeed, it's instructive that Ray McGovern discloses and states that the real authors of this fake transmission of, of uh, uranium cakes uh, to Saddam Hussein was the Mossad.
He states that the uh, uh, the agency understanding of the genesis of this particular operation was the Mossad, and it was based on their knowledge of the operations of the Mossad and who gains. Now, Joseph Wilson had taken his distance from in, uh, from this particular attempt to provide rationalization for the new war on Iraq. And that is the genesis for the outing of his wife as not an analyst for the Central Intelligence Agency, but an operational officer. And that is the genesis as well for the liberal cry decrying of this, quote, violation of the law. Well, what is it that they are violating this law that they are to which the liberals are referring? The, the, the act was known as the Lou Wolf Act. The act was known as the uh, as the Suppression of Disclosure Act. Uh, it was in fact inspired and, in, and determined by George Bush Sr., who was uh, above all determined to prevent the disclosure of the role of the Central Intelligence Agency operatives such as himself, because that is involved in the, that those operations involve criminal acts of murder criminal acts of, of sabotage, criminal acts of overthrowing of governments, criminal acts of killing U.S. citizens, criminal conspiracies against the U.S. against U.S. governmental operations themselves that the CIA and its masters disapproved. So, indeed, the act known as the Lou Wolf Act criminalized the disclosure of the operations of the Central Intelligence Agency in assassinating people across the world, a utter subjugation of free speech and utter destruction of the ability to serve the needs of the many by exposing the crimes of the few, the criminal acts of those who hold state power in this society on behalf of ruling capital. Well, let's look at the official act, the Intelligent Identities Protection Act. Section 421, Protection of Identities of Certain United States Undercover Intelligence Officers, Agents, Informants, and Sources. Part C, Disclosure of Information by Persons in the Course of Pattern of Activities Intended to Identify and Expose Covert Agents. Now, this is an overarching uh, section because it states, quote, Whoever in the course of a pattern of activities intended to identify and expose covert agents and with reason to believe that such activities would impair or impede the foreign intelligence activities of the United States discloses any information that identifies an individual as a covert agent to any individual not authorized to receive classified information knowing that the information disclosed so identifies such individual and that the United States is taking affirmative measures to conceal such individuals' classified intelligence relationship to the United States shall be fined under Title 18 or imprisoned not more than three years or both, and there is an imposition of consecutive um, sentences. Indeed, 10 so, years was expected to be the minimal sentence for each individual who was disclosed. Remember, we're talking here about operatives whose criminal activities are being exposed not only to defend the innocent against who these murder operations of the CIA are carried out, but also to alert the American public to what is being done in their name, to alert those who have a right to know that crimes against individuals and crimes against societies and brutal terrorist acts of state are conducted routinely by the Central Intelligence Agency in the name of our people. In the October 1981 issue of Covert Action Bulletin, the last issue with its volumes of naming names, Lou Wolf did an analysis of the Intelligent Identities Protection Act, and he noted that the bill covers unclassified material and it's designed to suppress revelations that are derived purely from this unclassified material, public documents, that the bill covers FBI, military intelligence, and other agencies as well as the CIA, that the bill is not limited to the exposure of government employees. In other words, it covers present and former government employees, agents, informants, and what are called, quote, sources of operational assistance that the bill is not even limited to names. It speaks of, quote, information that identifies an undercover operative or source. 
that the bill virtually eliminates any whistleblowing in the intelligence field and that the alleged protections and any limitations that are stated in the bill are meaningless because, as Lou Wolf states, quote, the CIA and other intelligence agencies have stated many times that the disclosure of any of its personnel or operations impedes its effectiveness. Anything you do, in other words, the CIA says is an attack on the work of the CIA. Now, it's important to note that the CIA their operatives who were exposed, the more than 1,000 operatives who were exposed by Lou Wolf and the people at Covert Action Bulletin, and the 300 operatives exposed by, Fee, uh, by Phil Agee, were not in danger because of being named. Whatever in danger that they may have faced, and none of, no danger came to any of them, was because of what they did under their name. It was because of their actions. It was not because of exposing them. Well, it's the exposure of the operations that alerts people, but it is what they do that makes them hated and makes them legitimate targets of those who are their victims. Indeed, the Progressive Review on May 17, 1999, uh, disclosed what the... uh, uh, meaning of this 1982 Lou Wolf Act uh, was was about quote in a major move entirely ignored by the media the House of Representatives voted to make it a crime to reveal not only the names of current CIA agents but of former ones as well the House voice voted mandatory sentencing for those convicted of revealing names the effect is to provide cover for illegal CIA activity particularly in the United States it will be against the law to reveal William Clinton's involvement with the Central Intelligence Agency going back to his Oxford days. George Bush's decades-long affiliation with the CIA before he was named its director. Crucial information to reveal the 400 mainstream journalists who work for the CIA. The Washington Post's Benjamin Bradley's work for the agency. The CIA operatives involved in drug smuggling in this country out of such places as Mena, Arkansas. The names of CIA operatives placed in city police departments and in positions as... uh, uh, of authority throughout the United States. One of the only restraints on the activities of CIA is public exposure by the media. It is this very ability to tell the truth, to expose criminal acts, which preserves any prospect of democratic change in this society. The progressive continues. And what indeed are the criminal penalties for disclosure of clandestine information? The American Civil Liberties Union on October 11, 2000. We write to urge you to appoint the Intelligence Authorization Act, H.R. 4392, the bill creates, includes provisions taken from the Senate-passed version that threatens civil liberties across the board. It makes virtually all unauthorized disclosure of classified information a pu- felony, publish- or fel- felony punishable by a substantial fine and year- three years in prison. The second would legalize authorized intelligence activity that is illegal under the terms of any legislation adopted in the future. And the, uh, and the article of the, of the ACLU goes on to disclose that all of the whistleblowing activity, all of the investigative journalism, all of the exposure of the meaning of Vietnam, of the meaning of the Iraq War, of the meaning of covert operations across the planet, all of this is being illegal, uh, rendered illegal, and all of us who are engaged in speaking truth to power are the targets of this legislation which is designed in a totalitarian manner to shut our mouths to close our eyes and to render us complicit in the crimes of our rulers. Ralph, before we close today's show, I want to return again to the statement in Dirty Works by Phil Agee. His statement that some of the myths about the CIA are actively spread by the liberal critics. And I refer you to an article by William Rivers Pitt, who has authored books against the war in Iraq. And this one, Fair Game, is on 6 October 2003, and it can be found on truthout.org. In it, he refers to the wife of Joseph Wilson, Valerie Plain, as an extraordinary person doing an extraordinary job. And 
when he talks about her extraordinary job, what he's referring to is, quote, if said CIA operative is working to defend our national security by keeping weapons of mass destruction out of the hands of terrorists, and that is the work of Valerie Plain. And then also he refers to the front companies used to protect the identities of CIA operatives working to defend our national security and by proxy all of the agents whose lives are protected by that cover. And he's decrying the fact that they are now fair game as well. Valerie Plain is not, not defending you and me. Valerie Plain, as so well articulated by Phil Agee and Lou Wolf, is protecting the corporations, the imperial rulers throughout the world. And Maya, what this means is the following. When The Guardian in London publishes on September 27th, for 50 years, a secretive arrangement had been made to overthrow governments in the world, and it documents the specific assassination plot of Dwight D. Eisenhower and the CIA MI6 plan to uh, eliminate three of the most influential rulers in Damascus assassination plots in 1957. They prelude to the operations across Iraq. Disclosure of this information, the naming of the names of the operatives who carried out these assassination plans in Syria in 1957 are violations of the act. The FBI funded Hamas under Clinton, Haaretz published on the 7th of, uh, of October, today, this very day. FBI sent money to Hamas while Clinton was negotiating with Rye, uh, in, in Y. The FBI Phoenix office, in cooperation with Israeli intelligence, with the approval of Attorney General Janet Reno, was funding Hamas, secretly funding money to Hamas across uh, uh, Gaza and in Lebanon, according to Haaretz. We couldn't publish this today on the basis of this act. Ralph, well, the exposure of Valerie Plain by Robert Novak is a falling out among the thieves. It is not an attack on an extraordinary person doing an extraordinary job. You are listening to Taking Aim with Ralph Shunman and Maya Schoen. And we will be back for part two of The Gentleman Killers of the CIA when we will disclose George Bush's involvement in Operation Zapata and the Kennedy assassination the role of the Central Intelligence Agency in the killings of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy, the role of Lee Harvey Oswald as a CIA operative and an FBI operative. We will name the names right here on Taking Aim. We will continue the work that Lou Wolf and Phil Agee have so heroically made, uh, sustained. We will speak truth to power, and we will not be intimidated by putative acts of suppression, and we will not be influenced by liberal attempts to rationalize these acts by pleading the cause of the operatives of suppression, Lewis uh, Wilson, uh, Joseph Wilson, and Victoria Plain. You are listening to Taking Aim with Ralph Schoenman and Maya Schoen. You can reach us at 212-209-2953 or 707-552-9995. Our email address is now takingaim at wbai.org. Please note you can reach us at takingaim at wbai.org. Our internet site is www.takingaim.info. We'll be with you next week. This is WBAI, New York, 99.5 FM. This is Taking Aim with Ralph Schoenman and Maya Schoen coming to you Tuesday, October 14th. 
2003. Like any good spy story, the outing of Valerie Flame Wilson is far more complex than it seems on the surface. She's a hell of a shot with an AK-47, said her classmate Jim Marcinkowski, that is her classmate from the CIA training farm, Count Perry. Uh, Camp Perry. This begins an article, Secrets of the Scandal, by Nicholas D. Kristoff in the New York Times, October 11, 2003. She turns out to be a skill, uh, skilled in throwing hand grenades and to have lived abroad and run covert operations in some of the world's messier spots, says Nicholas Kristoff. Today we begin part two of Outing the Gentleman Killers of the CIA. Last week, we discussed more about Valerie Plain Wilson and her husband, who had been, at one point, an ambassador to Gabon, at another point, the deputy... Uh, Deputy Director of the... De- uh, rep- De- Deputy Chief of Mission in Baghdad, Maya. And not only that, but Director of African Affairs in the National Security Council. These are not minor figures. They are not analysts. These are not only operatives, but they're in charge of covert ops in many theaters and over a sustained period of time. According to Nicholas Kristof, it's it may have been that Mrs. Wilson, that's Valerie, also called Valerie Plain, had actually been outed by Aldrich Ames, along with many other spies, and her name given to the Russians before Ames's arrest for espionage in 1994. As Christoph writes, her undercover security was undermined at that time, and she was brought back to Washington for safety reasons. And, and Maya, there's a specific reason for that. Because as Christoph reveals, she was brought back to Washington because she was skulking along the back alleys of Beirut and Algiers in covert operations of which she was a director and a very well-trained, hands-on operative. That means with not just hand grenades and not just the uh, paraphernalia of sabotage, but with the means of killing. These are figures who are part of the arsenal of imperial design, covert ops who sabotage, who organize hits, who take out people. This is the nature of the Central Intelligence Agency and its instrumentality uh, is the vehicle through which the ruling class destroys popular movements, overthrows governments, murders people in their beds, and carries out a sustained reign of state terror on behalf of U.S. imperial rulers. An interesting article by Warren Strobel appeared in the Knight Ritter newspapers on the 12th of October entitled, Breach Puts Lives at Risk, Insiders Say. And in it, he elaborates more on the history of Valerie Plain and her relationship to the CIA. Born in 1963, which would make her 40 years old now, she graduated from Pennsylvania State University and was quickly recruited by the CIA, attending training classes in 1985. By 1990 and in 1991, Plain was attached to the U.S. Embassy in Europe. And if you will recall, last week we discussed in detail how CIA operatives work undercover of the State Department assigned to the various embassies. And also they work under the Commerce Department, with the Commerce Department setting up agencies in countries, in each country throughout the world. Now, according to address records, it suggests that she operated under official cover for quite some time. And Knight Ritter actually accumulated the address records, but voluntarily they withheld the precise location of the embassies. Now, Plain's name didn't appear in the State Department telephone and the embassy director, directories from that period. But Knight Ritter is stating conclusively that she was operating undercover, under official cover for the CIA at a U.S. embassy in Europe. Also, it's important to note that the CIA 
spends quite a bit of money in training their operatives. Uh, minimally, in the first session, at least $350,000. But to train a full-scale killer and operative, it costs in the millions of dollars. And Maya, the Warren Strobel Knights uh, report of October 12th uh, doesn't uh, mince words. Plame's career was as a covert operations officer in the CIA Directorate of Operations. As you have been indicating, this had a series of covers, a specific cover being the Brewster Jennings and Associates, which is a... uh, 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 an example of a proprietorial organization, a CIA front, of which uh, there are an enormous number. In every country in the world, there are nominal private organizations, research institutions, non governmental organizations, corporations, which are in effect proprietorial companies of the Central Intelligence Agency. Let us be very clear about it. The institutional nature of U.S. capitalism and its rule, in whatever nominal heading it chooses to, uh, to, to assign itself is performing the function of the murder squads, the covert ops, the subversive uh, conduct of operations intended to eliminate uh, opposition, to destroy people who are but advocates of social change, to, to uh, compromise governments that are not sufficiently compliant. That is the dynamic that is the meaning of the functioning of these people. And, and cons- Ralph, most of all, the purpose of the CIA is to undermine any national liberation struggle that is taking place throughout the world. And that is well documented by William Agee in his seminal work. Philip inside, Agee, I mean, not. Philip Agee. Oh, what a day. Philip Agee in his seminal work Inside the Company, where he describes his own efforts in Ecuador in exposing the um, uh, resistance movement in Ecuador that led to their brutal torture. And that was for him an epiphany when he happened to be in a police station and the very people who he uh, upon of whom he had given information, were being tortured. Now, Brewster Jennings and Associates, the very company under which Valerie Plain was working recently, the CIA front company, Vince Canestrero, formerly the CIA's chief of counterterrorism operations and analysis, said that to the Knight Ritter newspapers that this was a company that other CIA officers had been using. But what's also interesting is that while many of the CIA front companies, such as Air America, actually carried out a business, Air America being a, a transport company, Brewster Jennings and Associates, when reporters went to the address, Uh, checked out the address and the phone number for Brewster Jennings and Associates. The very building the the very building where it was supposed to have been located the building manager said he had never heard of this company and there was no phone listing by the way Maya since you brought up Air America I think it's essential to point out to people that Air America was the uh, CIA uh, company that was running the drugs and the heroin out of Southeast Asia in a regular uh, mail run virtually uh, from uh, Laos and from uh, uh, Indochina into the United States. Uh, uh, in fact, not only was the CIA proprietary airline running uh, heroin, but they were actually taking the bodies of U.S. soldiers and eviscerating them and stuffing the corpses with heroin where uh, these bodies would be met by military personnel at, uh, at JFK and the heroin removed from the corpses. That gruesome detail of the nature of the gangster state uh, was disclosed by Dick Gregory and myself in the in the years when it was occurring in the, during the Vietnam War, and it has long been acknowledged and has been written about by many people. But the point being that Air America and these proprietorial organizations provi- preside over the operations of a criminal 
gangster clique, which is this ruling class. And we emphasize this in almost every program uh, <clears throat> that we have uh, <clears throat> brought to Pacifica because we have seen in the recent disclosure of the uh, Bush administration's outing of Valerie, Val Valerie Plain that people have then uh, uh, sought to... Uh, romanticize the figures uh, who have been fingered by the central uh, by the Bush administration or whomever, and that I think is a fatal flaw. The falling out among the thieves. Yes, the the, the squabbling over the spoils. Because let's be ex extremely clear about this: there is a significant wing of the ruling class that includes Brent Scowcroft, that includes Norman Schwart uh, uh, Schwarzkopf, that includes many of the criminal figures in the ruling class who were involved in the most nefarious various operations in the first Gulf War and in the setting up of Saddam Hussein and in the instigating of the Iran-Iraq conflict and of all of the perfidious operations of U.S. imperialism in destroying regimes, in installing Saddam Hussein, in organizing the murder of Abdul Karim Qasim and the destruction of the, Iranian re the Iraqi revolution of 1958. The crimes that lay at the door of U.S. imperialism are also the the uh, actual uh, w work product of people like Joseph Wilson IV and his uh, spouse, Valerie Plain. And when these people, like Brent Scowcroft and the like, have taken their distance from the neocons and from the, uh, the agenda of dismantling each government, uh, client state in the Middle East, fragmenting them, the neocon agenda, the agenda of the Likud, the agenda of the Mossad, the agenda of that wing of capital that considers that they no longer can afford, no longer can pay for, no longer can tolerate the intermediate regimes that have the, been the, administra the administrative instrument. These people are engaged in a tactical dispute about how best to work imperial rule. And so when they are outed, in an internecine conflict, yes, make use of the fact that they disclose that the Niger uh, uranium cake pretext for invasion was a fraud. But every single act of these very people in the course of their careers has engaged in disinformation on the part of the Central Intelligence Agency, targeting people who they have demonized in advance, the murder of Mehdi Ben Barker, my friend in Morocco, the leader of the socialist movement in Morocco, is at the hands of the people like Val Valerie Plain. What was she doing skulking in the back streets of, of, of Rabat in Morocco, carrying out the mandate of Central Intelligence Co uh, Agency covert operations in North Africa? What was the fate of many of the leaders of the Algerian Revolution, but at the hands of people like Valerie Plain and her Mossad, Mossad counterpart, counterparts in the years of destruction of Resistance in Algeria. Let's be very clear about this. In exposing the internecine conflicts and the meaning of those conflicts within the ruling class, it is fatal to romanticize them and even more so to use the felony uh, legislation of 1982, which was designed to shut up people like Philip A.G., like Lewis Wolf, like ourselves, like everybody who attempts to expose the nature of capitalist rule to silence us, to prevent us from naming names. That's the purpose of that legislation. Let us now invoke, not now invoke it, because its real target is all of us. In terms of naming names, today we are going to discuss the target Syria and target Iran and target Venezuela. The operations of the CIA in against these countries. And in terms of naming names, I'd like to refer to Wilbur Crane Eveland. Wilbur Crane Eveland, who worked for the CIA for many years in the Middle East under Kermit, Will, uh, Kermit Roosevelt, who was the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt. And Kermit Roosevelt was the chief of operations in the Middle East. Now, in Ropes of Sand, a book to which we've referred when in discussing Iraq because of Wilbur Crane Evelyn's revelations about Saddam Hussein as the CIA's man in Baghdad, particularly in the staging of the assassination of Abdul Karim Qasim. And, but in Ropes of Sand, America's Failure in the Middle East, Wilbur Crane Eveland names names, names names specifically about the uh, operations of the CIA to undermine Syria. He speaks of particularly 
the work of the United States and Great Britain. George Kennedy Young was the deputy director to Major General Sir John Sinclair, the nameless chief of MI6, known to all but a few in Britain as the letter C. C meaning he was the chief who was in charge. Now, Young had said that Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Syria threatened Britain's survival. This was in 1956. That their governments would have to be subverted or overthrown. Mind you, 1956, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Syria threatening Britain's survival. Maya, let me mention at this point, I uh, don't want to interrupt, but there's a book that's just been published by Stephen Kinzer, the New York Times correspondent, called All the Shah's Men. Now, he is also the author of a prior book called uh, uh, Bitter Fruit, regarding the Central Intelligence Agency uh, putsch in Guatemala in 1954. And the, the predicate for that was what you've described in 1953 with Kermit Roosevelt, which was the overthrow... 56. Uh, oh, you're talking, you know, about, talking 53. about the 53. I'm talking about the 53, the 53 with the overthrow of Mossadegh and the installation of the Shah. That was the premier Central Intelligence Agency putsch and assassination campaign. And by the way, the people who were involved in the 53 and the 54, the Kermit Roosevelts and the uh, E. Howard Hunts, would feature then in the uh, in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And we're going to detail the role of the Central Intelligence Agency in internal assassination in November at the time of the 40th anniversary of the execution of the of John uh, uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, absent any romanticizing of the Kennedy brothers, you can be sure. But notwithstanding that, the, the fundamental point is that all the Shah's men, as it's described by the publisher half a century ago, the United States overthrew a Middle Eastern government. The victim was Mohammad Mossadegh, the democratically elected prime minister of Iran. Although the coup seemed a success at first, it is, serves as a chilling lesson of what con the consequences of foreign intervention. And indeed, the account is centered on the reconstruction of the events and how the assassination across I uh, Iran prepared for the overthrow of the regime. Uh, Mr. Kinzer, a veteran correspondent for the New York Times, uh, lays out the names of the operatives. He, he names the names, and that is the fundamental point. None of this work, none of this uh, investigative work would be possible if we, did not, if, we, if we do not challenge the attempt to silence our naming the names of these criminal gangster operatives of American imperialism in every arena. Ralph, it's a good thing you mentioned 53, so we can be in a historical timeline. And one of the little-known facts about the 53 coup in Iran is that British Petroleum had been active with the oil resources of Iran prior to 53. And as a result of the U.S. control and the, with the displacement of Mossadegh, who was uh, nationalizing the oil, the United States oil companies moved into Iran. Now, back again to other parts of the Middle East, because here we have the British uh, colonial empire trying to regain control in the Middle East as well as working with the United States to uh, substantiate uh, to um uh, gain control and divide up the spoils. So we have Young, George Kennedy Young, the deputy director to, MI, to the chief of MI6, meeting with the Americans to discuss Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Syria as the next targets. What Young said was that, was that their, the governments of these three countries would have to be subverted or overthrown. Iraq was the central point of British support and area stability because you had their stooge, Nouria Saeed, in position, and they wanted to strengthen him as quickly and as much as possible, according to Evelyn's report. Turkey and Iran were also considered allies um, because of the recent coup in U.S.-sponsored coup in Iran and that they would help with the British action. So what they were saying is they would first target Syria and then proceed to an overthrow of King Saud next. And with NASA, they were coming with plans for his assassination. So we see here, Maya, just to make the point that the, each country in the Middle East has been at every conjuncture 
targeted for assassination of its leaders and even for the removal of the government in place. So there is always the agenda of imperialism to remove any authority that is not sufficiently compliant and to contemplate seriously direct military control of their resources. Now let's go to how they would do it because it, this is what you're going to find is greatly similar to what is taking place today with the target of Syria and Iran. They were going to stage border incidents with Turkey. The Iraqis would stir up the desert tribes and the Parti Populaire Syrian in Lebanon would infiltrate the borders until mass confusion justified the use of invading Iraqi troops. Already, Young said, they discussed all of this with their prospective participants and as well they had discussed this with the Israelis. Now, Young said that the meetings were taking place at the highest level of the British cabinet. And in the United States, this was all happening under Alan Douglas. Uh, Dulles. Alan Douglas, Dulles, the head of the CIA, and Kermit Roosevelt. And they were in meetings with Selwyn Lloyd and the SIS, which was a division of British intelligence. Now, this is 1956. And to incorporate the press, what Evelyn did is he met in the United States at the St. George Bar with Cyrus Sy Sulzberger and Joseph Al Alsup and Homer Begard of the New York Times. And he planted with them information about the border incidences um, and also with Sam Brewer of the New York Times. And Sam Brewer is the one who left for Syria and ended up promoting the CIA's agenda in uh, Syria. Which amplifies the seminal disclosures of Harrison Salisbury in his deck, uh, Gentlemen Killers of the CIA, when he noted the role of the New York Times and of the main establishment media in, f in servicing to provide disinformation handed and, and, and uh, uh, ordered by the Central Intelligence Agency. Much of the feature stories in the mainstream press preceding major U.S. interventions is the disinformation of the CIA assets that are within the key placements in New York Times and other such media. Now, one last point about Evelyn's report. The operation was called Operation Straggle, and a group, the Omega Planning Group, was set up in the U.S. State Department. So we, invo we had involved here not just the CIA under Alan Dulles, but also the U.S. State Department. And part of this included, quote, the elimination of leftist officers from the Army. Now, I want you to note this because recently... September 27, 2003, an important article by Ben Fenton appeared in The Guardian in Great Britain. Macmillan-backed Syria assassination plot. Ralph? Yes, and that is very uh, evocative, Maya. I mean, it has a particular meaning for me because it deals with the private pa papers of Duncan Sands, who was Macmillan's defense secretary. And uh, those were the years when I first went to Great Britain and was working with Bertrand Russell, and I had the opportunity to confront Duncan Sands in 1959 at a conference over then at CIA and uh, MI6 plans in uh, in Africa to murder uh, 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 Ogingo Dinga and other leaders of the national independence movement in East Africa and, and so on. We confronted him with the data. Uh, he fulminated about communist subversion, but he couldn't refute the documentation. And here we have, as you say, on the 27th of September in The Guardian, Macmillan-backed Syria assassination plot. Parenthetically, I should mention to you that Bertrand Russell in 1962 gave a speech at the Birmingham Youth Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament upon the disclosure that John F. Kennedy and Macmillan were contemplating a preemptive 
preemptive nuclear war against the Soviet Union with a specialized report prepared by Robert McNamara that estimated that the U.S. would win World War, war III at the cost of 160 million American lives, 90% of Europe's population, the insanity of this gangster state. At that time, Russell gave a speech in which he said Kennedy and McMillan were worse than Hitler. He was much pilloried for that. But he said never had the Nazis put into play the kind of genocidal campaign that would have extirpated 90% of Europe's population, not to mention 160 million Mar uh, North Americans. Coming back to the fundamental point here of this article, 50 years before the war in Iraq, the article begins, Brit Britain and America sought a secretive regime change in another Arab country they accused of spreading terror and threatening the West's oil supplies, planning the invasion of Syria and the assassination of its leading figures. The newly discovered documents show how, in 1957, Harold Macmillan and President Dwight Eisenhower approved the CIA MI6 plan to stage fake border inc inc incidents as the excuse for an invasion of Syria. The plans, frighteningly frank in their discussions, were discovered in the private papers of Duncan Sands, Mr. Macmillan's defense secretary, by Matthew Jones, a reader in international history at Royal Holloway University of London. And indeed, this article, which is extraordinarily evocative and important because of its detailing of the criminal nature of the Central Intelligence Agency, MI6, at the hest of the rulers of capital in the United States and Great Britain. They had prepared to topple the regime in the autumn of 1957 through the assassination of three leading figures, which was, as the article states, at the heart of the scheme. In the document drawn up by a top-secret high-level working group that met regularly in Washington in September 1957, Mr. McMillan and President Eisenhower are left in no doubt about the need to assassinate the top men in Damascus. The men were Abed al-Hamid Saraj, the head of Syrian military intellige. Intelligence. intelligence. Afif al Bizri, chief of the Syrian general staff, and Khalid Bakdash, leader of the Syrian Communist Party. Now, it's important to consider why they were going after Syria. Syria was the location of an important pipeline, an important pipeline that's recently been shut down by the United States after the takeover, the occupation of Iraq. And this is a pipeline that moves the oil from Iraq to the Mediterranean and also it goes from Iraq to Turkey. Ralph? Yes, and what this uh, article goes on to say is driving the call for this action was the CIA's Middle East chief, Kermit Roosevelt, grandson of former President Theodore Roosevelt, the man who organized the CIA assassination pro program and the coup d'etat in uh, Iran, in Tehran, in 1953. And it was Kermit Roosevelt who identified Colonel Siraj, General Abisri, and, Ms. And, and, and Mr. Baghdad as the real power uh, in Syria the men to be eliminated. The preferred plan stated, quote, once the political decision is, is reached to proceed with instigating internal disturbances in Syria, the CIA is prepared and, and SIS MI6 will carry out sabotage and coup de main inst incidents throughout Sir uh, Syria, working through contracts with assets and individuals. It is not the crisis which has changed, nor is it the evil which is new. The very program that is out now being uh, prepared for Syria and Damascus today is the continuation of the policy of murder and sabotage and the destruction of governments and the elimination of popular leaders and the complete decimation of movements for social change in every arena of struggle of the oppressed and in particular in the oil rich Arab East. So here we have in this article by Ben Fenton documenting the discoveries of the papers of Duncan Sands, confirmation of what Weber, Wilbur Crane Eveland was writing in Ropes of Sand. The relationship between the CIA and SIS, which is MI6 in Great Britain, comparable intelligence operations to undermine and to take over Syria. Now, part of the plan was funding of a Free Syria Committee. Does this sound 
uh, similar to what we have the United States setting up in Iran with the special committees for democracy or the recent committee now set up for uh, Cuba to uh, destabilize Cuba that, that was which, just announced. Well, that which is prepared as we as we speak and which we will detail in the Venezuela of uh, uh, Hugo Chavez. Now, CIA and MI6 would institu- instigate internal uprisings, for instance, he notes, by the Druze in the South, help free political prisoners held in the various prisons, and stir up the Muslim Brotherhood in Damascus. Isn't that similar, I ask you, to what the Mossad has done in Palestine with the uh, support for Hamas. And not only the, the Mossad, let us be clear, because Mossad was one of the, cre- for, uh, the creators of Hamas along with Saudi intelligence, but it has been disclosed recently that the United States FBI was funding Hamas right through and including the Clinton years uh, under the direction of, Ma- of uh, Madeleine Albright during the Y negotiations, funding Hamas, the terror apparatus of the uh, intelligence agencies itself, the suicide bombings to be laid at the door ultimately of U.S. intelligence. You are listening to Taking Aim with Ralph Schoenman and Maya Schoen coming to you Tuesday, October 14th, 2003 on WBAI 99.5 FM in the tri-state region of New York and on the internet at www.wbai.org. Our program today is part two of Outing the Gentleman Killers of the CIA. Part one is on our website already in our program archive at www.takingaim.info. Maya, let me just take a moment here uh, to give the flavor of the documents drawn up in Washington by the top echelons of the CIA and the Secret Intelligence Services. They were to create political turmoil as the pretext for invading uh, Syria, as we have indicated. They were to, in fact, uh, uh, organize operations that would demonize the Syrian regime. They were to, to uh, above all, instigate false flag operations. CIA and SIS would use their capabilities in the psychological and action fields to augment terrorism, to organize sabotage, national conspiracies, strong arm activities, and I'm quoting, in Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq, responsibility for which would be attributed to Damascus. They They would murder people, they would blow up things, they would uh, uh, um, carry out atrocities, all of which would be attributed to Damascus. These were operations in which the special action section of the SIS and the Central Intelligence Agency specialized in such things in the 1940s and 1950s uh, in their, and, and now we're uh, applying their, uh, uh, their MO uh, to this uh, campaign against Syria. Here is the modality of the false flag operations of which September 11th is the little continuation of the standard procedure of the gangster state in fomenting the conditions for invasion, for permanent war, and the seizure of resources. In prior programs some months ago of Who's Next, we discussed taking out Syria, taking out Iran, taking out Saudi Arabia, taking out China. And on October 11th in the Sydney Morning Herald, there was a startling headline revealing exactly what we have been discussing. Stalking Syria. The article continues. More terrifying than the bombs dropped near Damascus last week, referring to the Israeli bombing um, of uh, a camp on October 5th, was the message they carried for the regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Game over. Game over. Only four days after that attack, The U.S. House of Representatives on October 9th, the International Relations Committee, voted 33 to 2 to ban the export of, quote, dual-use technologies to Syria. The Syrian Accountability and Lebanese Sovereignty Act is sure to pass the full House 
and George Bush will be empowered to ban American investments in Syria and freeze Syrian assets in the United States. And this with the uh, ardent support of all Democrats and Republicans alike. They're going to basically rob the bank. They're going to move into banks and seize Syrian assets. They will confiscate the hundreds of millions of dollars of the Syrian government and take it away from them. And indeed, Ariel Sharon, as the article states, closely synchronized his strike on Syria with political developments in the United States, says Joe Sirincioni, an analyst with the Washington-based Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Before the Israeli strike, the administration was resisting sanctions. After it, they dropped their opposition and implemented them. Syria will answer this attack only through diplomatic means. Assad faces an invidious dilemma before he meekly accepts Israel's slap in the face. And it goes on to demonstrate that stalking Syria is the beginning of the application of the Cheney Mossad neocon operation for dismantling each country in its turn. The road Eight. to Damascus. As the Christian Science Monitor detailed on October 8th, the Israeli air raid is a direct implementation of the plan to resolve this conflict with Palestine by dismantling each Arab government in its turn. The road to Damascus in the Christian Science Monitor details the application of this plan as was the intent of the neocons from the 1970s on, 9-11 providing them with their moment of opportunity. Eyal Zeser, a lecturer, a senior lecturer at Tel Aviv University, stated, quote, Without American support, or at least the expectation of such support, this attack would not have taken place, referring to the strike against the Ain Sahib camp, which is only 20 kilometers northwest of Damascus. Now, if you look at another article that appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald, October 11th, by Douglas Gell, writing from Washington, you notice that, in fact, the United States didn't just give a green light to the Israelis to attack Syria, but in fact, the United States set up this attack. Listen and you'll see what I mean. U.S. spy satellite identified the Syrian camp. Quote, American spy satellites showed that the Syrian target attacked by Israeli warplanes last weekend had been the site of recent construction possibly to prepare it for use by the Palestinian militant group Islamic Jihad, United States officials claim. But if you read this article closely, you see that in fact that this was an abandoned camp that hadn't been used for years and in fact that there probably had been very little construction. But most importantly is this sentence, quote, the human intelligence had provided uncorroborated indications that the site might be used not just as a staging ground for attacks on targets inside Israel, but also for attacks against U.S. troops in Iraq, U.S. officials said. Notice, uncorroborated indications and might, always might be used, might be used by Islamic Jihad, is also stated by the U.S. officials, might be used uh, for U.S. attacks against troops in Iraq and human intelligence. What do they mean by this human intelligence? They mean very, very people like Valerie Plame of the CIA. The disinformation, the staged events, here in Haaretz on the 7th of October, an article that was then disseminated by the Associated Press from Haaretz while uh, former President Bill Clinton was going through the motions of an elusive peace between Israelis and Palestinians, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was secretly funneling money to Hamas and inducing the militant, and I quote, inducing the militant group to use the funds for terrorist attacks to use the funds 
for terrorist attacks. The counterterrorism operations in 1998 and 1999, having set up Hamas to carry out actions which would then be the pretext for response, was run out of the FBI's Phoenix office in cooperation with Israeli intelligence, approved by Attorney General Janet Reno, FBI officials told Associated Press Haaretz, October 7th, 2003. The pretext, the false flag operation, Democrats and Republicans alike, from Clinton to Bush Sr. and J Bush Jr., the standard operational procedure of the gangster state. So we have here the collaboration of Israel and the United States. As before, in the 1950s, we saw the collaboration of Great Britain and the United States also in discussions with Israel to attack Syria, to undermine Syria, and use that as an excuse to send U.S. troops into Syria, which was part of the Eisenhower doctrine that the U.S. would send troops into the Middle East to defend its hold over the oil of the region, the resources of the region. Now, soon after, very soon after, the attack on Syria, which was on uh, Sunday, the very next day on Monday, President Bush came out with the statement, quote, Israel's got a right to defend herself, that Israel must not feel constrained in terms of defending the homeland. This was the statement of President Bush. And according to an Israeli official, you don't ask for a green light and you don't get a green light. In other words, you just go ahead and do it and the, it is uh, something that has been planned in collaboration between the Israelis and the U.S. Well, they're not coy about it, Maya. On October 12th, the uh, diplomatic memo article by Stephen R. Weissman in the uh, New York Times, Sharon acts tough sensing U.S. assent. And the article details how the attack on Syria was a pre-planned operation based upon the United States, uh, not just uh, green light, but collusion in setting up the entire operation. This is hand in glove, like lips to teeth. The uh, Mossad and the Central Intelligence Agency, the, the Zionist settler state rulers and their masters in Washington, uh, uh, partners in crime. As noted by the Sydney Morning Herald with its reports about the U.S. spy satellite and the so-called human intelligence providing the basis or the pseudo-rationale for the attack. So what we have here is now coming out of um, Israel is the state, are the statements that this so-called base that was in Syria was actually being funded by the Iranians. And Ranan Nisan, who uh, is uh, an aide to Sharon, said, quote, We will not tolerate the continuation of this axis of terror between Tehran, Damascus, and Gaza, and so he was echoing Bush's axis of evil rhetoric, setting up a stage for both the strikes that have also been in the news, the strikes against Iran, as well as strikes against Damascus, which have already begun, and the continuing uh, strikes against the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. So let's see how this plays out. On October 8th, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald article by Timothy Phelps and Timothy Phelps in Washington about the serious sanctions sailing through the U.S. Congress because the Bush administration has endorsed Israel's bombing of Syria and given the all clear to the U.S. Uh, Congress to institute the economic sanctions against uh, uh, Syria, which in essence is designed to do to Syria what was done to Iraq, which is to strangle the economy, to, to uh, begin the process of eliminating food supplies, institu instituting epidemic disease and starvation to bring the regime to its knees and indeed this is the background to Israel as the Reuters reported on October 8th clearing the way to call up its army reservists clearing the way to call up its army reservists in anticipation of major war in the Arab East and indeed the uh, uh, reference that you made to uh, uh, the plans for Iran are also made clear 
Israel, the, the Guardian re, uh, reported on October 12th, is deploying nuclear arms in submarines. A detailed article by Peter Beaumont in, uh, in London and, and, uh, and Colonel Urquhart in Jerusalem in The Observer about the uh, deployment of nuclear arms in submarines in preparation for major action. And on, on the 12th of October... Der Spiegel, Israel insider, Israel is preparing strike to take out Iranian nuclear sites. And indeed, the Mossad plans for preemptive nuclear strikes uh, uh, in Iran were uh, confirmed in, uh, in Jerusalem. And here are the story. Israeli press gripped by reports of nuclear war plans on Iran. Mossad has planned preemptive strikes to attack six nuclear the presumptive nuclear sites in Iran. In other words, an all-out air attack on Iran in conjunction with the attacks on Syria. Yedir Aharonot Ma'ariv and Harat splashed uh, a story that were carried in the Los Angeles Times report that modified U.S.-made cruise missiles carrying nuclear warheads on submarines are allowing Israel to launch atomic weapons from land, air, or sea and are connected to the plans that their Spiegel specified of special Mossad units receiving offers to or orders two months ago to prepare for imminent strikes on a half dozen targets in Iran. According to Mariv, Sharon told his associates, quote, Iran is the greatest danger to Israel and that he was coordinating all the intelligence gathering efforts with the United States, quote, down to the last detail. And Mossad chief Meyer Dagan was to devote, quote, his utmost efforts to gather the information about Iran's growing nuclear capabilities, but already the detailed plans have been prepared by the Mossad, according to Der Spiegel, to destroy the nuclear sites. Now, if you'll recall, in 1981, Israel did carry out a strike against Iraq's nuclear reactor at Osirik. Now, that was co considered complex, but feasible. According to the Israeli Air Force fighter jet pilots, the attack against Iran is much more complex since the uh, sites are further from Israel and there are many more of them. Now, of course, there is no proof that uh, Iran is developing any uh, military nuclear policy when, in fact, Israel is known to have at least 200 nuclear weapons and many, many more. If you requ recall the exposures by um, Mordecai Venunu many years ago, who's been in solitary confinement all these years for his exposures of the nuclear uh, weapons development by the Israeli the Zionist state. And indeed, Maya, the uh, Osiric plant was not a nuclear arms plant any more than those are they are in, in Iran. Uh, at the time in uh, in uh, Iraq, there was the attempt to uh, develop nuclear energy, much as the uh, uh, North Koreans have attempted to do so in the uh, in the uh, absence of a sustainable means of providing power in the face of sanctions, in the face of blockades, in the face of the deteriorated infrastructure. And and leaving aside the question of the merit or lack of merit of nuclear power stations, nuclear power stations are not nuclear weapons plants. And the cynical operations of the Victoria Plains and the Joseph Wilsons and their counterparts in Central Intelligence were engaged in the disinformation to provide the rationale for the gangster attacks on sovereign states, the destruction of OSIRAC, the attack now on Syria, the pending attack on Iran, which services an agenda of global global hegemony for the 2%, the 1%, in fact, of the 90% of our people that owns, uh, let me uh, restate that, the 1% of our population that owns 90% of the national wealth. That is the ruling class that has captured the state. That is the root of this criminal behavior of the gangster state that we've been detailing in this as in other programs. Well, in the remaining minutes, let's look to the articulation of this agenda, which was made very clear in a 1996 document called A Clean Break that was prepared by Richard Pearl and David Wormza for Benjamin Netanyahu for his campaign for prime minister in Israel. David Wormza 
is a member of the State Department Office of Arms Control, along with John Bolton, uh, another war hawk. And uh, he had worked under Vice President Dick Cheney and his Chief of Staff, Louis Libby. Formerly, he was with the American Enterprise Institute and the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. These are the neoconservative organizations. And along with Richard Pearl of the Defense Policy Board, uh, in years prior to his being on the Defense Policy Board, Wormser and uh, Richard Pearl crafted this document called A Clean Break, in July 8, 1996. Yes. 1996, right. Ralph, do you want to go into no, some mean, of the, the document? The, sure. The, the, the document is a, is a uh, virtual mind comp. It's a blueprint, much as the uh, uh, project for the New American Century is a blueprint. Uh, at the American Enterprise Institute uh, on October 7th, Leo Strauss, the, uh, his acolyte William Crystal, acknowledged that the United States had been the had been remiss in not quote already moving beyond the Iraq war to the next regime change uh, and, and the next uh, Middle East uh, government to be removed the uh, uh, 1996 document the clean break uh, with Richard Pearl of the Defense Policy Board and Don, Don Rumsfeld and such was the articulation of the necessity for a clean break from any attempt to mediate settlements with any of the regimes in the Middle East and for for their instant and immediate overthrow. It states specifically, one, destroy Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian Authority, blaming them for every act of the Palestinian, any act that is uh, waged against the Zionist state. And two, induce the United States to overthrow Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq. Three, launch a war against Syria after the um, after Saddam Hussein has been deposed. Four, parlay the overthrow of the Ba'athist regime in Baghdad and Damascus into what is so-called democratization of the Arab world, meaning the takeover, the privatization, the corporate control, and the setting up of pro-councils and pseudo-governments in these countries so that they're under the direct rule of the Zionist state and the United States and the imperial control. And the clean break, Maya, calls then for further military action against Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the, uh, and I quote, the ultimate prize, Egypt. Sounds like the Odadinon document. It is the Odadinon document. Even with the words ultimate prize. The ultimate prize is taken directly from Odadinon's document, a strategy for the 1980s, which repaired in the late 1970s, which became the benchmark document for the National Security Agency and for the American Enterprise Institute and the uh, Project for a New American Century. This document document of Oded Yinon, the Mossad operative, called for the fragmentation of each Middle East country in its term, in its turn, and this very language of the clean break is derived specifically from that document. And setting up the Saudis, which we have documented over a period of time, every single time people cite the J. Michael Springman data on the visas that the CIA insisted were given to Saudi operatives to come into the United States in relation to 9-11, every single time this, dev- this evidence evidence is invoked on Pacifica and elsewhere, it is deployed to suggest that the Saudis on their own are involved and responsible for 9-11. As we said in setting up the Saudis and taking out the Saudis, this is providing cover for the operation to to, uh, destabilize and remove the Saudi regime itself. These Saudi operatives were indeed involved under the direct control and running of their masters in the Central Intelligence Agency. These people would not take a single quarter step without the approval and the sanction and the knowledge and the control of the ruling class in the United States and the Central Intelligence Agency. In particular, the ultimate prize, Egypt, for the first time in 30 years, Israel launched bombing raids against Syria, 
targeting a purported camp inside Syria. This is the opening note of the implementation of the Clean Break. The principal author of the Clean Break and a series of follow-on Institute of Strategic uh, Policy Studies strategy papers long anticipated and prepared for this event, now under the desk of uh, not just uh, Dick Cheney, but of Wormser's wife, Merev Wormser, who was, a, who was another of the class break authors, who was head of the Middle East policy at the Hudson Institute, which was har- heavily financed by Lord Conrad Black, owner of the, the, uh, uh, the Hollinger Corporation, and the sugar daddy to Richard Pearl, who was installed by Black at the Hudson Institute, and this is the think tank that has provided the, uh, the propaganda. By the way, Mayrav uh, Worms uh, uh, received her doctorate uh, uh, for the glorifying of the life and works of Vladimir Jabotinsky, uh, the uh, founder of Revision Zionism and the, uh, uh, the uh, intellectual author of the, uh, of the policies of the Likud. Ralph, I'd like to mention that one of the authors of the Clean Break, a new strategy for securing the realm, this 1996 document was Douglas Fife, who is the Deputy Secretary of Defense for Policy and whose name has been very much mentioned on our programs. David Wormser, as you mentioned, is now in the office of Vice President Dick Cheney. So the authors of this Target Syria document, moving on to targeting Egypt, targeting Iran, targeting Saudi Arabia, are very much within the power structure of the current Bush administration. We're out of time now, so in future we'll have to deal with the CIA plans in Venezuela, as well as plans in countries throughout the world to destabilize, to seize control of the resources, to prevent the self-determination and aspirations of the peoples of the world. Let me just say this, Maya, because as uh, we had, uh, we had, we do plan to do. Uh, We are going to detail the plans to murder Hugo Chavez, the specific Central Intelligence Agency plans to murder him under the direction, by the way, of Charles Shapiro, a nominal State Department functionary and ambassador to Caracas, playing much the same role as Joseph Wilson IV and Victoria Plame. Valerie Plame. uh, Excuse me, Valerie Plame. We speak of outing the killers, naming the names. What was so aptly described by Harrison Salisbury in his seminal article, The Gentleman Killers of the CIA. Name the names, expose the plots, speak truth to power, identify the crimes. You've been listening to Taking Aim with... Ralph Schoenman. And Maya Schoen, our program today, part two of Outing the Gentleman Killers of the CIA. You can reach us at 212-209-2953 or at our new email site, uh, takingaim at wbai.org. You can also access our programs at our Internet site, www.takingaim.info. I'd like to thank Kathy Davis for engineering at WBAI, Michael Yoshida for here at KPFA, and Bradley Weedmeyer, who works with us each week on the production of our programs and without whom we wouldn't be producing Taking Aim. I want to remind you that the WBAI Fun Drive is starting, and Taking Aim will have a special three-hour program next week beginning at 3 p.m. and going till 6. So mark your calendars and be with us next week from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Tuesday. For revelations, for information, for mobilizing, and for activating, join us next week. Our program will be the underlying politics of 9-11. 